Ecamm Live 4.0 has just been released and it is a massive update with some amazing new features. And if you haven't been using the beta, then these are all going to be completely new to you. So I am going to go through all of the new features of 4.0 in this video, and there's a lot to get through. So uh, let's get on with it, shall we? Uh, before we sort of go through individually all of the uh, you know dozens of features that there are, I thought it'd be worth talking about just the kind of four headline features, if you like, uh, the major things that are in this release. Uh, the first one being multi-streaming, that is the ability to stream from Ecamm live to multiple different platforms without the need for a third party service like Restream or one of the others. Uh, so that is uh, a great new feature that lots of people have been asking for. There are some caveats with all of these things that we're going to talk about. So I'll talk about why you may still want to maintain that uh, Restream account uh, a little bit later when we dig into the multi-streaming. Uh, next off, though, we'll talk about the uh, camera switcher. Um, so this is a new way of uh, viewing the different cameras that you've got coming into Ecamm Live. So previously, we've had that little strip with all the uh, small little cameras. Uh, images of the different cameras that you've got coming in. Now we've got a dedicated window for it, which actually the sort of simplicity of the window belies the functionality that it adds. So this is a huge thing, actually, in my opinion. Um, and so we'll be diving into all of the features of this new camera switcher functionality. Next is ISO video. This has been a much requested um, feature within the Ecamm Live community. That is the ability to uh, record not just your sort of primary recording, um, but also to have individual recordings, individual files of, you know, elements within there, like your maybe your primary camera, maybe a secondary camera. If you've got guests coming in on interview mode to have a separate video file just of their feed. Uh, the reason why you might want this is if you want to sort of edit things together after the fact or re-edit things, you know, put them together in a different way after the fact or maybe just even just a repurpose uh, some of the content so if you're doing interviews and you want to take out some of the uh, the uh, the guests words of wisdom and make those into you know vertical format uh, shorts or whatever the, w that happens to be um well we can now do that with iso video so we'll be diving into that and uh, the uses and limitations of it as well uh, then next up is uh, related to interviews is this increase in the number of interview guests. Again, something that a lot of people had wanted, uh, you know, to be able to have more than four guests. Uh, well, now we can do. Uh, I say we can do because with these things, as I've mentioned, there is some caveats with all of this to uh, be aware of. Um, and so the before we actually get into the implementation of these, I thought it was just talking about that and the compatibility. So there is a couple of differentiators, really, um, when it comes to uh, Ecamm and these features. First off is going to be uh, what plan you're on. So whether you're on the pro or the standard plan. Next is going to be uh, whether you are on a Apple Silicon um, or the Intel Max. So when it comes to multi-streaming, uh, in the early betas, this was talked about as being a pro-only feature. Actually, now that it's rolled out, they are making this available to everyone. So whether you're on standard or pro, Intel or Apple Silicon, uh, multi-streaming is, uh, is there for you to use. Next is this camera switcher. Again, that is just a standard feature that is available on uh, both plans and also regardless of the, the, uh, the type of uh, computer that you have. Next is ISO video. This is a really processor intensive uh, thing to do uh, because instead of just encoding one video, um, you are encoding multiple videos. And if it comes to, uh, you know, obviously you can have a couple of different cameras, you've got your main feed, um, and then you've got, you know, potentially up to 10 guests. Um, you can see that there's going to be a lot of processing going on. And so it is a pro feature. Uh, and also it is just limited to those, uh, those Apple Silicon uh, computers as well. Now I should say ISO video is in addition to isolated audio. So we've had isolated audio uh, recording since, uh, well, I can't remember what version that came into actually, um, but that is the ability to record isolated audio tracks of all the things that you've got going into Ecamm. Uh, that was a pro only feature. It still is a pro only feature, but that still does work uh, even if you're on an Intel Mac. Uh, next is the number of interview guests. Now, uh, previously the maximum was four and it still is if you're on an Intel Mac, um, but for, for Apple Silicon, as I mentioned, uh, this is going to go up to uh, 10. So you can now have 10 guests there. There's another thing that I want to mention, which isn't really a headline feature, but whilst we've got this uh, little chart up, um, then that is uh, widget overlays. Uh, these are something that um, you can uh, use to add various different web widgets onto your uh, and into your Ecamm Live production. They've made some big enhancements to this, which make them really versatile and actually far more useful than they, than they were before. Um, and they were always a pro feature. Well, Really great news. This is now also going to be available for the standard plan. So uh, we'll dig into uh, these a little bit later as well. Uh, and we'll talk about all of the enhancements that have been made to widget overlays, uh, amongst other things. 
So I just wanted to touch on those four headline features, uh, but really there is so much more to Ecamm Live version four than just those uh, features. Um, and so I thought it useful to actually break things down a little bit. Um, and so what we're gonna do is go through this video. I'll leave timestamps down below so you can sort of jump ahead or find what you're looking for. But basically we're gonna be talking about the interface changes. There's changes to the way that you just even interact with Ecamm Live now. Uh, so we'll talk about those. Uh, then uh, multi-streaming, we'll dig into that, these sort of technicalities of how to do multi-streaming streaming, uh, scheduling streams and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, then we'll talk about this new camera switcher and all the functionality and the, uh, the options that that gives you. Next is camera settings. There's been some enhancements to that and some new uh, functionality there as well. Then we'll move on to ISO recording. Lots to talk about with that one as well. Interview mode, some changes there that I've uh, sort of alluded to as well. Uh, and then we'll talk about overlays. So I've already talked about the widget overlays. There's been some improvements there, but also with uh, text overlays as well. Next, we'll talk about Stream Deck and Loop Deck. Um, lots of great new uh, additional functionality added there. Um, some really useful things that uh, I'm just loving. So we'll talk about that. And finally, we'll talk about some general sort of compatibility um, uh, changes that have been made to uh, just make things, make it work with other systems and services uh, a lot better. So that's the, uh, the sort of agenda. So let's start by then taking a look at some of these interface changes because there is a few changes uh, and things look a little bit different. Let's start with uh, a really easy one, which is that um, previously the Ecamm Live main window um, had a limit on how big that it could actually go to. Whereas now what you'll find is you can stretch it a lot further. So it used to be a little bit of a frustration actually, sometimes when I was trying to, especially in the design process and lay stuff out, and then it's you know quite small on the screen. So it's really great now that you can basically just make this uh, as big as you want. So a great little uh, feature that uh, might not be immediately obvious to you. Um, so what you'll see now though, is that there is a couple of other changes sort of uh, aesthetically to uh, the way things look on the screen and the layout. Um, you'll notice that we don't any anymore have the uh, uh, little text down at the bottom that says the recording destination, uh, whether you want to go to YouTube or wherever it happens to be, or whether you want to just record uh, that was previously down here uh, that's now been moved up to the uh, the top of the screen um, and you'll see here that there is this little drop down and when you drop that down you've got the option here to select whether you want to stream record um, and then also you can toggle on and off the virtual camera from here as well. I should say that uh, it says virtual cam. It is actually the camera and mic. Um, so you'll see this little indicator that we have up here showing that the camera and mic are on. And then when I toggle this one off, those two things will disappear. So this is no, not a new function as such. You know, this was always available from the output menu. And then we could turn the uh, virtual cam and the virtual mic on there. It's just that we've now got this option to toggle it on. One thing I like about this though, is that as well as being able to toggle the virtual camera on um, you can actually toggle the recording and the streaming both off and what that means is that then uh, you'll notice that the little record button down at the bottom uh, that disappears so it means that if you're only using this as a virtual camera um, to go into zoom at you know certain times which is the majority of the time that I'm using Ecamm I'm using it for you know going into zoom or teams or things like that um, so the ability to actually turn that off and just remove that unnecessary thing from the interface uh, is a great little thing in my book so if I turn it back on though, we're now going to record. Uh, if you turn stream on, uh, then you'll notice that that brings up some uh, other little things down the bottom, but we'll talk about those uh, in a moment. So for the time being though, I'll just stick with the recording. Uh, one new feature that has been added in is the ability to add a little countdown to the record button. So uh, this may turn on by default when you first start, um, but you have the option here to, in the recording section, um, uh, to record only countdown. Uh, and what that means is when I uh, just get this out of the way and then I hit the record button, you'll notice that it does actually count down on the button itself. So it says three, two, one, uh, and then the recording starts. So this was a feature that a lot of people had asked for, uh, the ability to just sort of basically count them in if you like. Uh, personally, I don't particularly use that feature myself because I tend to just you know hit the record button on the stream deck and I wanna know that when I hit record, uh, I'm recording. So uh, if you don't want that function, then you can just turn it off. Uh, I'll just hit the end recording button for a moment. Um, then you can turn that off. That is in the recording section of the Ecamm Live preferences. And incidentally, uh, this is a new section within preferences. So they have made some changes to the uh, the preferences window. We'll sort of come to these as we go through the different sections, but I will just mention it. Uh, so the recording section is now here. Uh, we've got this record only mode. Um, this is where we're gonna find all the stuff to do with isolated video and things like that. We'll get onto that in due course. Uh, what they've also consolidated is um, a number of the uh, different uh, destinations 
applications. So things like Facebook, LinkedIn, there was previously a button for each of those along the top or a section, I should say, <laughs> that you could click on along the top. Uh, that's now all been moved into this uh, destinations uh, tab. So that's where we're going to be uh, looking at multi-streaming and things like that. But we'll come on to that in due course as well. So that is the record uh, button and the uh, sort of slight change that's been made to that. Uh, one thing that you'll notice now that I've ended that recording is on the screen right now, uh, there's another thing that's been added in, which is whereas before we had an option to go to uh, show the file uh, in the finder, uh, or we have an option to send to YouTube. So that means that once you finish recording, you could just hit a button and it would upload it to YouTube uh, that we've had for a long time. Uh, but now what we've got is also this option to edit in Descript. So when you hit that, it's going to actually uh, upload it to the uh, Descript in the cloud and then uh, open Descript on your on your desktop. So if you are recording stuff in Ecamm for editing in Descript, you can now basically get it in there with a single click, which is uh, which is great. So I'll just hit OK for that. So in terms of other adjustments that have been made here, what you'll also notice is we've got down the uh, uh, right hand side, we've got one extra button and that's this one. And this is for the camera switcher window. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit later, but that is just another addition to the interface uh, to have that camera switcher button uh, just over there to open up that window. Uh, some other options in the uh, in the menus as well. Um, so in the uh, recording section, uh, we've got this option here to add a marker and uh, add a marker with info. So what's what are those about? Well, if I hit the record button, so it's going to count in and start recording. So now I am recording, and if I go to the recording and hit the uh, the little button up here to add marker. Uh, what it's going to do is it's actually going to add a timestamp in a text file. So I'm just going to hit it. Uh, that is the uh, M key is the shortcut for that. There is a Stream Deck button, which I'll be talking about a little bit later as well. Um, so we're, I could add a number of different uh, text markers. You'll notice it says down at the bottom, marker added. So we can see that it's just added a marker in there. Um, and these are for, you know, timestamps in uh, YouTube, for example, you can add in timestamps. So that's the way that I've got the timestamps down the bottom of this video. You just add in the sort of time in, and then you can add in some text uh, to, uh, to actually add in the sort of the title for that particular section in YouTube. You may also want it to just actually mark a point um, so that you've got a reference. Maybe if you are, you know, I've just said some pearl of wisdom during a live stream and you want to remember exactly the point that you said it, uh, then you can hit this marker to uh, mark that point. What you can also do, though, as well as just creating a sort of time, uh, you can actually add uh, text to it as well. So add marker with info. If I click that button, um, then that's going to add a marker, but also it's going to give me the option to uh, actually type something in here. So if I just type, well, it's typed in chapter. So let me just type in chapter one to uh, save me typing anything else. And I'm just going to click on add. And now it's going to add in that marker. So the way that this actually works then is once we finish our recording, if I hit on uh, hit finish uh, down here, and then if I go into my recordings folder for Ecamm, what you'll see is, if I drag it on here, you'll see that uh, on here I've got the recording over here, um, and then I've also got this text file. So if I open up the text file, uh, what you can see is it's got the uh, 00, zero start and then it's got the first two uh, that I did maybe that's a little bit small let me just make that bigger uh, the first two timestamps which if you remember were ones where I just literally hit the button uh, so that was at 12 seconds in and 20 seconds in and then that one where I actually typed something uh, you can see how that's actually put in the name of the chapter as well so that is a, uh, a great little feature and uh, we'll look later on at how you can do this with Stream Deck and uh, it's when you use it with Stream Deck that I think it's got some real uh, power in terms of, you know, planning a run of show uh, and putting those chapter markers in as you go through. Uh, it's a great little feature. So we'll talk about that in more detail a bit later. Now, another thing that's been added into the menu bar is an another little uh, feature, which is if I go to the output um, and then we've got video monitor. So that is uh, where you can actually have the, the output from Ecamm going to a secondary monitor. That's what I use when it's going to my teleprompter so that I can see what's going out in Ecamm. Um, then uh, you have that there with the uh, video monitor. What, what they've added now is the ability to flip that uh, horizontally. So um, sometimes people find it more uh, easy to work with if they are seeing themselves kind of reversed on screen. So it's more like uh, the way a mirror would be uh, so that they don't find themselves pointing in the wrong direction. Um, so you now have that option 
option in here to flip horizontally. Just know that it's only what you're seeing. So if anything looks backwards, like writing on the uh, uh, on the screen or anything like that, um, then it's 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 just the the monitor that's like that is not the actual output. So that's a nice little uh, feature that I know uh, some people find useful. And just coming back into the uh, preferences for a moment, uh, the other thing that is uh, a new feature here, which I didn't just mention before, um, in terms of the, uh, the the new arrangement of preferences, is this one here, the remote control. Um, so now you have the ability to um, grant access to Ecamm for things that want control of it, like uh, Stream Deck, Loop Deck, and so on. Um, but you also have a, uh, the option here to sort of revoke that access. So if you have given things access to it in the uh, security system preferences, um, you know, as you go through and install these things you can just sort of uncheck those there so stream deck loop deck being an obvious couple but then there are other ways that you can potentially interface with ecamm as well so that is just a new section there uh, shortcuts uh, that's not new in this version um, however um, what you'll find is that these are now remembered on a profile by profile basis so you may well have different uh, shortcuts set up uh, and this by shortcuts i mean the uh, mac os shortcuts um, so you could have different shortcuts for uh, different profiles and that means that uh, when ecamm live opens you can run a shortcut maybe shut down some other apps uh, when a broadcast starts maybe turn off on do not disturb when a broadcast finishes things like that again this isn't new for this particular version so i won't go into it too much uh, but just the now it does actually sync on a profile by profile uh, basis it also uh, does on a profile basis uh, does actually remember these settings as well so whether you are set to stream record or virtual cam uh, those will be remembered on a profile by profile basis as well so if you know you have one that is just to be used as virtual camera uh, then you can turn those off and that will be remembered as well so that is uh, a few of the sort of just interface changes that they have made and there is more that we'll discover as we uh, as we go through as well but the next thing kind of related to that we've seen how you can turn on the recording and the uh, virtual cam and then also toggle on that streaming and that really brings us nicely onto streaming because uh, this multi-streaming feature is uh, really uh, really impressive but also it does uh, sort of change the way that you set up and bro uh, set up your broadcasts and schedule them in ecamm uh, before there was uh, one way of doing it now we're going to do it slightly differently so let's have a look at uh, how we are going to do that <laughs> so back over on uh, this machine then by the way i'm just running ecamm on two machines so i'm sharing uh, one with uh, with you now because obviously i can't show you how to schedule things whilst i'm recording so that's what's going on here uh, once you select the uh, stream though down here let me just clear this out of the way um, then you'll see a couple of things first of all any upcoming streams you've got so uh, i've got one coming up in just a couple of days uh, where i'll be talking about um not just all of the new features obviously that's what this video is um but i'll be going in specifically into some of the use cases of not those really sort of high uh, high level uh, features such as multi-streaming and so on but i'll be talking about some of the little smaller minor features that people might overlook so that's what my live stream is going to be about this week i'll leave a link to it in the description uh, so you can go and check that out as well uh, but in any case you will see any upcoming streams and you do see the little sort of thumbnail there as well um, but you can also see here where you've got where it says upcoming if you click this it is actually going to show you just a list of all the streams you've got coming up and it also shows you where they are going to uh, and you can also see this little icon here this little pencil icon to actually edit the scheduled event we'll come on to that in a moment but if you've got lots of different events coming up you'll be able to see uh, what those all are and select the one that uh, you want to actually stream to uh, so what, what you can do from here is if we want to uh, schedule a new event, uh, we can hit this button down at the bottom, uh, this new button. So if I click on that, this is the way that we are going to uh, then schedule a new, uh, a new live stream. So the first thing is uh, we've got this window that's popped up. We can give it a title. Uh, we can give it a description uh, and then here because it's going to youtube i can set uh, select the visibility uh, so whether it needs to be unlisted public or private or whatever um, and then some additional platform options so there's going to be things specific to the platforms uh, in this case latency made for kids and so on so you can either go live now and so if i was to hit that uh, give it a title and description i'd just be able to hit the go live and it would just go live immediately um, or you can obviously hit the schedule button and schedule it for a specific time and in that case you can also add in a uh, an image for your thumbnail what you'll also see down here though is it does tell us our required speed so here it's saying 5.9 megabits per second uh, this by the way is set to uh, i think 1080p uh, 30 frames per second um, and that is the required uh, bandwidth for the upload to uh, actually deliver that stream 
So what we can do though, is we can also add in other destinations because obviously we're talking here about multi-streaming. So to do that, I just simply click in here, uh, click on one of those other destinations. Uh, so if I click on this one to uh, Facebook, for example, um, then if there are any additional um, features that need to uh, you need to bring in uh, here or select, then those will appear here. Uh, by the way, there is a feature in Facebook called uh, Facebook cross posting, which is something you set up on the Facebook side. So if you're managing multiple different pages, for example, uh, Facebook can automatically cross post it to those um, on the Facebook side. Um, if you have got that set up on your your Facebook back end, as it were, um, then those would appear down here and you'd be able to select which of those other pages you want it to go to. Um, that is just a way that you can actually sort of offload some of the uh, the sort of uh, bandwidth overhead, if you like, uh, from your own computer is if you are streaming to multiple Facebook pages, do it on their side and let Facebook uh, take the, uh, the extra bandwidth cost from you. Um, but you can add in multiple pages though now with uh, multi-streaming. So it's not just streaming to multiple platforms. You can actually stream to multiple, uh, you know, YouTube pages, multiple Facebook pages. Um, and it's just a case of going and adding those in. So I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but what you will notice is now that I'm streaming to two platforms, uh, you can see down here the required speed is uh, given as 11.8. And so we'll talk in a moment about how you can uh, sort of adjust that in the, uh, or check that I should say, in your preferences. But here, as I say, you can just go in and click add uh, and add any other different uh, destinations you want. Uh, but if you want to add a new one that you haven't already got in there, then click on the add destination. This is going to take you into system preferences. Um, so you can click on here. And then we could add a new destination in. So uh, say Amazon, for example, uh, click in here, add in your uh, stream key and then just click on add here and it would add it uh, into the uh, the list there. Uh, but you can also do this from system preferences. So that doesn't take you directly there, but you can come into your, sorry, Ecom Live preferences, I should say, uh, and click on destinations. And here you will see uh, the list of the destinations you've got. Uh, and then you can click on add new destination. And then that just brings up that exact same thing there. Uh, if you go to additional destinations, um, this is going to bring up some other ones. Uh, and funnily enough, it's the uh, multi-streaming uh, destinations like Restream, Multi-Stream uh, using Switchboard and uh, OneStream. So uh, those, if you still want to use those, um, then that is how you can access those. And that actually brings us to a good point is why might you still want to use uh, Restream uh, or one of those other services when we've now got multi-streaming in Ecamm? Well, do bear in mind that we are streaming to uh, um, all of the different destinations from your computer. And that's why when I went from just to one destination to two, uh, you notice that the bandwidth requirement went up. And so if you're someone who hasn't got a great internet connection or you haven't got the bandwidth, you want to stream to 10 different destinations and you haven't got 50 uh, megabyte up speed, um, then you're still going to need one of those other services. So it's just something to bear in mind. Um, whereas with Restream uh, or the, one of the other services, you're just streaming once to them and they are dealing with the bandwidth requirements to stream to all of your different platforms uh, with the ecamm implementation uh, you are literally streaming to all of those places directly from uh, from your side so that is one reason why you might want to keep your multi-streaming uh, platform around uh, there's another reason though which is that currently in the current version of ecamm um, you have to set the um, uh, the stream resolution that you want um, and it needs to be kind of the lowest common denominator because it's going to be the same going out to all of the different platforms. So I do my uh, live stream of Backstage Podcast and it goes out to, uh, for the live part of it, the live stream, I stream to Amazon and to LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn, the maximum resolution is 1080p, uh, whereas with Amazon, the maximum is 720. So what that means is that uh, if I was to do that through Ecamm using the multi-streaming um, then I would be basically limiting my recording to 720 as well. Um, so if you want to have a higher resolution recording, uh, then there is still something to be said for uh, having one of those other services so that you can uh, still record in 4K, but stream to uh, restream and have them send it at 720 to Amazon. So that's one of the two use cases that I see where you may still want to keep uh, restream around. And indeed, that's what that's what I've done <laughs> for, for that use case. But if you're only streaming to, you know, Facebook and, and, and YouTube, that in itself might not be uh, might not be an issue so speaking of the speed then one of the other features that they have added in is a way to test what actual speed you are capable of and uh, and how uh, how many platforms you can speed uh, stream to at any given time now you'll find that in the uh, ecamm live preferences under stream 
and you'll notice down at the bottom here um, it says required speed four um, and then uh, you can select how many destinations so if I've got one destination you can see the stream size I've got set to 1080p the stream uh, um, stream shape I should say and the frame rate there 30 frames per second that's going to be what dictates this um, uh, required speed so if I say uh, one uh, one destination um, then it's going to be that much if I was wanted to go to de eight different destinations it would say I need 47.3 megabits per second you can see the little check mark next to it there and that's saying that uh, I do have the required bandwidth for that and you can see down here it's got speed test result now this is something that is only available in I think it's Monterey uh, and later so it's using an Apple functionality um, and so it's part of part of that so if you're earlier than Monterey I don't think you'll see this uh, speed test result so I think that's the cutoff it's either that or one of the previous versions but it's it's basically related to the operating system in any case uh, but you can see there it's telling me my speed is 82.1 um, so I'm capable of doing that 47.3 uh, if I was to take this higher I still can't quite get over it at uh, 10 uh, 10 10 destinations I should say that there is a limit by the way of uh, 10 so uh, regardless of your internet speed the current limit for how many places you can stream to with Ecamm is 10 so uh, that might be another reason to keep those other platforms around if you are really streaming to more than 10 destinations if you are I'd love to know where and why in, in the, the comments um, so that is the, um, the the speed test that is built in and that is how you're going to be able to see whether or not you have the required bandwidth to stream to all of the places that you want to stream to now in terms of actual live streaming whilst you are streaming there are a couple of differences uh, and improvements that have been made there as well um, so first of all um, I'm not streaming right now but uh, if I was uh, you would see up at the top uh, bearing in mind we're now streaming to multiple different destinations where before you could see the sort of number of viewers and thumbs up uh, now you'll be able to just sort of click into uh, this little box which will appear here which isn't there right now uh, but it will actually show you you know how many views you've got on the individual uh, platforms from there as well what you can also then do is you can actually stop the stream on individual platforms as well so if you are you know streaming to multiple different platforms and then you want to end the stream on one uh, and bring people over to another one uh, or you know you've got a sort of after uh, after show party going on on one particular platform then you can end the stream on individual platforms and maintain it uh, on other ones uh, one other thing as well is if the stream does fail on individual platforms for one reason or another network or whatever it happens to be it will still continue on the um, the platforms that you're you're still streaming to uh, the same goes for the recording if you're streaming to even just an individual platform and something uh, goes wrong with the uh, the stream or that you lose connection or something it's not going to stop the recording which it would have done in the past um, so that is uh, some functionality which I'm not really showing you because I'm not streaming right now but that would be just up here I'll make another video specifically about that but one thing that I can say is uh, whilst you are um, streaming then there's been some improvements made to the chat as well so where you've got the uh, the chat window and where you'll see the comments come in uh, let me maybe just make the uh, main window a little bit smaller like that uh, so if you've got the uh, the chat window just down here for comments and reactions um, and then also the interview chat so I'm going to bring the interview chat window over as well he says trying to <laughs> why is it not growing it it'll get it in a minute there we go so uh, here we've got the two different chat windows so when you are in interview mode uh, if you've not used interview mode before maybe you're not aware uh, but you do have a separate chat for you to chat back and forth between the people in the interview uh, window but one thing about that is sometimes the people on the interview uh, side um, may not be seeing the comments because if they're not monitoring on the platform the comments coming in live and if it isn't a comment that you've actually put up onto the screen uh, then they're not going to necessarily see them uh, well now if you've got a comment in the uh, main comments uh, and chat window uh, comments and reactions uh, you can now just grab it uh, and drag it across and drop it into the interview chat so think about that if you're doing an interview or something like that and you want to sort of queue up questions or maybe a virtual conference or whatever it happens to be um, you could be sort of queuing up different questions and putting in them in the uh, in the the interview ease chat window so that they can see them there as well incidentally that whole feature of just being able to drag and drop a comment that now works with uh, with anything so with notes or anything like that as well it just drags and drops it as a uh, text so if you've got anything that comes up in the chat you can just drag it into uh, another you know notes file or whatever it happens to be if you want to keep it that way 
Uh, incidentally, not a new feature, but uh, you do have all of the chat saved after the fact, um, in any case from a live stream and it's saved as an SRT file. So that is a kind of text file. Um, but maybe if you double click it, it's not necessarily going to open. Um, if you do want to actually access that, all you need to do is change the file extension from SRT to TXT, and then you can just open it up in any text editor. Uh, and the way that looks is basically a series of timestamps with all of the comments and who left them in there as well. But as I say, not a new feature, uh, but just one to be aware of. Uh, the other thing, though, that has been changed in the uh, comments and reactions is it now does show little badges for um, when people are leaving super chats um, or, you know, super thanks or anything like that. Um, and then also if they are channel members or moderators. So that's just another little indicator that you will have on the uh, on the little chat so that you can make sure that, you know, if it's a channel member leaving uh, a comment that you are aware of that. Whilst we're talking about chat, another huge one for me personally is the fact that uh, now we have Amazon chat uh, can be bought into Ecamm. So any messages that are coming through, if you are streaming live to Amazon, um, very few platforms seem to have access to uh, the chat on Amazon. I know BeLive, which is a different platform, uh, they've had uh, the ability to get the Amazon chat. Uh, but now... Thankfully, it's coming into uh, directly into Ecamm. So this there was a whole workaround with a Google Chrome plugin that you could get to extract it and then use it as a widget overlay. Um, so I love it when <laughs> there's some workaround hack that we've had to find before, and then uh, now it's just available directly in Ecamm. So if you are streaming to Amazon, um, then uh, yeah, all of your chat comments will just be coming in just as uh, as you would like them to. So that's multi-streaming, an absolutely awesome feature. And as I said at the beginning, you know, this is something that's available for standard and pro plan. And again, uh, Apple Silicon and Intel. So uh, everyone can uh, can use this. Just do bear in mind the bandwidth requirements and uh, take advantage of that speed test to just make sure that you can actually handle the uh, bandwidth. Um, so lots of new features there still lots more to come and i've just got to say that uh, all of my ecamm live masterclass has been updated with all of these new features as well so if you do want to really take your knowledge and understanding of not just ecamm actually but the things that you use in association with it like taking it into zoom for zoom presentations using it with stream deck um how to create immersive presentations how to make on-screen graphics like this even um then you can find all of that in the ecamm live masterclass you get lifetime access so you know people have bought this previously uh, will get access to all of these new updates that are coming with that uh, 4.0 being released uh, and likewise you know if you take advantage and sign up to the ecom live masterclass you get lifetime access so that any future updates you will find you have in there as well and it's really broken down into you know logical steps so all of the beginner stuff first of all uh, where everything is in little bite-sized chunks uh, it becomes kind of like your online encyclopedia for ecom live because if you want to find out about just one specific aspect or refresh your memory on one specific access uh, <laughs> aspect you'll find them all there broken down into little bite-sized chunks so it's very watchable and bingeable as well you can just go through uh, sort of a couple of minutes at a time um, and then also I've got sections there on as I say uh, keynote presentations all that I'm doing here today bringing these things in this is using a combination of keynote with Ecamm so I talk about that in there as well and as I say just all of the sort of things that go along with it as well so ecamlivemasterclass.com is where you can go and uh, find out more all about that but uh, let's crack on and the next thing then that I want to talk about then is uh, another great feature which is the camera switcher and this is to be honest uh, possibly one of my favorite features so let's have a look at how this all works I mentioned previously that there is this uh, new button just up in the uh, the top corner here, which is uh, this one. Uh, and this is gonna open this camera switcher window. But before I do that, just uh, to sort of reiterate that what we're talking about is um, this is the existing camera switcher um, that allows you to, uh, if you've got the scene source set as a camera, um, allows you to switch between different cameras. So I could uh, click here and switch to this one if the scene wasn't locked, <laughs> schoolboy error. Uh, let me just unlock that scene, <laughs> then I can do it. Uh, so if I was to click here, then I can obviously switch camera uh, like this and switch between cameras. So uh, that is the uh, the existing camera switch or the, the previous in implementation of it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not really big enough to actually see what's on those cameras. It was just intended to give you a small visual cue, enable you to uh, uh, switch between them. Um, well, now this new camera switcher is basically a completely free floating window. Um, now, the other thing about this was um, this one here on the screen, this only applies if you are using the scene source 
as a camera. So if I come up to source up here, uh, you can see you can choose either screen share, camera or blank. Uh, the thing was, I always tend to build out my scenes um, starting from a blank scene and then use camera overlays. That tends to be how I tend to build out scenes. Um, so in that case, when I'm starting from a blank scene, um, then this camera switcher on the screen was a little bit redundant as well because um, it wasn't really functional for the overlays on overlay camera overlays you set individually by overlay. Um, so um, with this one, if you no longer want to see this on the screen at all, then you can come to the uh, settings. And then in here, there is an option where my settings gone. <laughs> I've got too many monitors here. Uh, so the settings down here, um, you can see this one show camera switcher in main window. So if you don't ever want to see that little camera switcher, you can just toggle that one off and then it won't appear because the other thing is it sometimes gets in the way when you're trying to, you know, do layouts and things like that. Um, so this is the way that I'm doing it now. I'm not using that camera switcher at all. I'm just using this one. Um, and the functionality that this gives you is if you want it uh, really small, just like it was before, you can certainly make it like that uh, and you can resize it. And we've got exactly the same functionality that we just looked at. So being able to just click into any one of those cameras and it's gonna change the camera that you've got on your main scene. Um, however, where this really comes into its own, in my opinion, is the fact that you can use this almost like a monitor to see all of the different cameras. And for sure, you know, if it's just for you and maybe yourself in an overhead shot, that might not be uh, so critical. Uh, but when you start adding in uh, guests and things like that, um, then it's really handy to be able to see all of these guests. And now that we can certainly have you know up to 10 guests and multiple cameras, then being able to see those all together in this window is really useful. If you're doing something like a virtual conference where you're using interview mode and you're just sort of bringing different people in up onto onto the virtual stage, as it were, uh, then being able to say, see just sort of visually if uh, somebody's ready to come up or if they're you know even sitting in front of their uh, camera or not is uh, really helpful. And you can see here it says guest one. Uh, but obviously, if you've got multiple different guests, then all of those people would be lined up here as well. Um, but that's just the start of it. Uh, what you can also do then from here is uh, for each of these individual cameras, um, if you think about the uh, camera effects window uh, that we've got, um, not that one, <laughs> wrong window, uh, camera effects window, written right at the top of it. Uh, so this is where you can make adjustments to um, your you know, camera settings and things like that. Uh, previously, if you wanted to change the settings for a different camera, uh, then you have to click in here and then you go and select the one that you want to adjust and then you can make the uh, necessary adjustments. Well, now you can actually do that directly from here. So uh, you can see this little magic wand symbol, which is also the same symbol to show and hide that camera effects window. Uh, for each of these individual cameras, you can now click on that uh, and you can see that down at the bottom, the camera effects window just here uh, maybe I'll put it where you can see it a bit better <laughs> as I change the uh, the camera here it's basically changing the camera effects uh, window that you're working with or the camera that whose effects you are changing if that makes sense made a bit of a pixie of that but there you go um so that just makes it really simple to you know if you want to adjust this camera to just be able to go through and do it like that so a time saver and also it saves uh, adjusting the wrong one i've done that before where i thought i was zooming in on one camera but i just re didn't realize that i hadn't got the right one selected at the top the other thing that you can do with this as well though is these three little dots next to each of these individual cameras um, you can uh, show source in a separate window um, so this is useful as well if you want to sort of build out your own uh, view of um, the uh, the different cameras that you've got coming in maybe you want a view of uh, your sort of main camera and then maybe the other ones are don't need to be so big uh, you can just pop out all of those show source in separate window so you could make something like that and obviously I've got these all on the same monitor so it doesn't really uh, make sense like this uh, at the moment um, however if you imagine this being on the second monitor because you can just drag these across to a second monitor uh, you could make any sort of layout that you wanted uh, of you know all the different cameras if you were doing something in a live production environment where you wanted uh, to have a monitor that had all of these on for someone else to see or maybe you're doing a, an interview show or whatever it happens to be and you want to be able to give other people views of themselves for you know different camera angles or whatever it is you've got the versatility to do that with uh, with with this camera switcher uh, the other thing that you can do from in here as well is you can also um send the source from one of these uh videos directly to a specific monitor so you could have it you know go i've got two other uh, monitors attached here so i could have this going out literally to uh, you know full screen uh, to one particular monitor again useful if you are in a sort of some sort of live production environment where you want to ha have this whole uh, feed of one of these cameras going out to there or something 
Um, and then you've also got the option to uh, to just remove from the switcher as well. So we've had that before. If you uh, know, like you can you can use keyboard shortcuts, by the way, for uh, switching cameras. So uh, if you just hit the number two, it will go to the second camera. Number one will go to the first one. Uh, four will go to the fourth one. So uh, that's just hitting the keyboard buttons. Obviously, I tend to do it with uh, Stream Deck. Um, but if you look in the uh, list of cameras up here, um, you can see all of the different cameras. But you'll notice how... Uh, some of these have got letters assigned to them, um, whereas other ones don't. And the ones that don't are basically not featured in the camera switcher. So previously, you would have to come into this menu and then you could just select which ones you want to include in the switcher. Whereas now you can just go in here and you can remove any one of these from the switcher. Um, but equally, you can also go and, uh, and add it back in as well. So if I click on the little plus icon um, and then I can just pick that camera out of the list and I can just straight away add it back in like that as well. So that's how you can sort of choose what cameras you want to uh, be using. Uh, the other thing though that is really great about this is <laughs> I mentioned before that I tend to build out my scenes starting with a blank scene and building things out from there. Well, if that is how you uh, build out your scenes as well, there's a really great little trick here because if you uh, change your source to blank uh, and you want to just build out some scene quickly, uh, you can literally just drag and drop cameras from here um, onto, your, uh, onto your scene. So if I want to put that one there, maybe I'm going to have a guest over here um, and I can just drag and drop these like that. So it's a really great way to have this as like basically a, a set of uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, placeholders that you can just sort of drop wherever you want them to be. Uh, I've got my terminology mixed up a little bit there because I've just used the word placeholders. Uh, it's on my mind because that is another great new feature of um, this particular release is the idea of placeholder cameras. So up until now, what you've seen me doing is I've just been going through and basically um, selecting the uh, the camera that I want to use. If I would created a whole series of scenes, um, let's say this one, which is my uh, um, ZVE-10. Um, so if I had gone through and created a series of scenes and put that camera in each scene, um, then there is this issue that can happen sometimes where if you've got multiple different cam links um, connected and cam links are the ways to take HDMI from your camera into an the cam link and then take that into your your uh, computer over USB. Um, if you've got multiple cam links uh, connected, um, then the computer sometimes forgets which one's which. It's not a, uh, a an eCam thing; it is a Mac thing. And so, what can happen is people can create a series of scenes in eCam with camera one, two, three, and four, and uh, in Keith Powell's case, seven. <laughs> um, but then, what can happen is sometimes when you switch on the uh, if you switch off the computer and switch it back on again um, then uh, you can sometimes find that those have been sort of switched around because the uh, the Mac hasn't remembered where they uh, which one was which basically um, which can be a, a bit of a frustration if it means you've got to go through and sort of adjust various scenes there is a workaround for this whereby you just sort of plug them in in the same sequence each time um, and so that sort of solves it from that point of view but what they've added in Ecamm in this version is this concept of placeholder cameras and so here you can see in the camera switcher, as well as all sources, just up at the top here, we've also got this one which says A slash B. And that is this concept of having a placeholder camera, whereby um, instead of designating a specific camera um, for a specific scene, uh, you can just put a placeholder there. And then that means that you can assign the camera uh, later. And it also means that, uh, let's say, for example, you've got uh, m multiple setups. Maybe you've got a studio setup at home and you've got another one at the office and you take your uh, laptop back and forth between them um, and you've left the camera there or whatever it might be. Um, and you want to use your you know, built-in laptop camera when you're on the road. But then when you're back in the office, you want to use your uh, you know, built-in uh, camera there or your uh, fixed camera that you've got set up in your studio, um, then you can use these placeholder cameras. Um, so here I've got two scenes. I've got scene one, which has got my main camera, uh, and then I've got scene two, which is uh, my top-down camera. And imagine if I'd also got like lots of other scenes built out with all these cams, uh, cameras in it. Uh, well, imagine if my uh, my cam links had been uh, screwed up or something like that, and it didn't remember where they were. Uh, well, now, instead of going through each individual scene and changing out all of these different uh, cameras and swapping them around to where they should be, uh, what I can do now is I can just come to this uh, AB switcher here, uh, this... Um, uh, one for the placeholder cameras and then I can just change the camera that is associated with that placeholder in Ecamm. So I can change this one to be uh, the this camera for example uh, and then I can change this one to be the cam link.
And so by just changing that in that one uh, little instance up there, um, that will go through and propagate through all of those scenes where I'd got that camera A and B. So that is one uh, way that you can use this is to sort of protect if your, your camera, your computer forgets which camera is which. Another great use case for this, though, is if you are someone who uh, builds out entire profiles for people where you've got different cameras and things like that set up for them, different scenes set up. Um, well, what you can do now is instead of having to, you know, educate them and tell them to, uh, OK, here is the, uh, the profile. You can install this profile. Now you've got to go through every scene and select the correct camera that you want for each scene. Now you just basically put placeholder camera A, that's the main camera, placeholder camera B, that's your secondary camera. Uh, you can add more placeholders, by the way. So I can just keep adding more and more of these. So you can add multiple placeholders. So if you were creating a really complex thing with multiple different camera angles, because you knew they had that set up in their particular studio, uh, you could create all of these things yourself um, and then just send over the, uh, the profile to them. They'll import that into Ecamm. And then all you need to do is just explain basically the mapping so you'll say okay camera a is your primary camera camera b is uh you know whichever one it happens to be so uh, that is a really great feature and i think that's going to be a huge time saver first of all it's going to be a time saver for me making these sorts of changes um but it's also going to be a real uh, help when you are you know sort of providing stuff uh, either as a service uh, maybe a paid service creating profiles for people um, or if you're just collaborating where one person designs the show uh, another one's running it on their machine uh, you know running an interview show or whatever it happens to be uh, maybe for, for your podcast um, um, it just makes it a much easier to make these one simple change and it propagates through the entire set of scenes. So related to the camera switcher, we've obviously got the camera settings as well. And there's a couple of things to uh, note uh, in terms of that. So let's take a look. Um, first of all, something to note is that in the camera effects window, um, when you are making a change to one of your sort of primary cameras that you've got, uh, those will apply also to any placeholders that are using that camera. So what I mean by that is uh, here I've got my uh, sort of main camera. Uh, if I come and select this one, um, so now I'll just change uh, my color just so that you can see something obvious. Um, now what you'll notice is if I go into the camera, uh, the placeholder cameras, those have also been changed as well. So you can't be in a situation where you've made a change to one and it hasn't propagated. So uh, it is it is global in that sense. If uh, Hopefully that, that makes sense. So what I can do now is just uh, reset this so that I don't look uh, quite so ill. <laughs> Um, and then the next thing down in the camera effects that's been added is a blur effect. So just down at the bottom here, you can see camera blur, um, and then we can just increase that. Um, am I on the right camera? Let me just uh, switch to a, this camera. This should be the scene source for this. Switch on the blur effect. There we go. Uh, you can see how much it is uh, sort of blurring me out there. Um, one thing to note about this is, although it's going to blur the camera, um, it's not the same as the sort of blur background effect that you may be used to if you've used something like Zoom at uh, Teams, where it can sort of artificially blur the background but keep you in focus. So it's not doing that. It's just applying it to the whole of the uh, the camera. Um, so uh, just something to be aware of. You'll obviously see it <laughs> as soon as you try it. Uh, next is uh, also this sepia, sepia tone here. Uh, so that's just another little thing uh, in addition to the uh, the black and white, which was in there before. Uh, now you have got mirror, uh, which is, uh, again, this is not new. I just wanted to point out because I mentioned earlier on um, that if you click mirror here, it is going to flick your, um, your, your video output. And that is actually going to be going out. That is different to the one that I mentioned earlier, which was in the, um, the output menu and the video monitor to be able to flip that. So if you flip horizontally in the video monitor, uh, that isn't what is going to be going out. It's only going to be going to be flipped for you. Uh, but if you were to flip it in here, then literally that would be going out. So everything would be, as you can see, written backwards and so on uh, in the background. Um, so that is the, uh, the new features that have been added into the camera effects window. Um, another thing to, uh, to note here, which is slightly different before, than before, is if I were to come into this uh, uh, camera switcher and I add in my iPad mini, and then I drag that onto here as an overlay just to sort of demonstrate this. And then I disconnect my mini. 
iPad mini, um, you get this. So, uh, and this is this applies to any camera. Um, now, if the uh, the camera is no longer connected, um, then you will get this uh, this little white box around it, and this option here to sort of highlight the fact that there is a camera missing, saying double click to uh, pick a camera source, uh, and that will just basically pop up this same box as normal, and then you could uh, select it from there. So, uh, obviously, that was just to demonstrate. But if you had got scenes with cameras and then the camera wasn't connected, it will sort of prompt you to connect a different camera, and obviously using the uh, the placeholder cameras now as well. Uh, hopefully that will be a bit of a thing of the past in any case. Uh, so that is really the uh, the camera effects and the additions that have been made there. Uh, what I'd like to talk about next though is uh, really linking in still with this uh, whole idea of placeholder cameras uh, because we're going to be talking about um, ISO recording and that is kind of linked to this idea of placeholder cameras because in actual fact when you are selecting the cameras that you want to record um, it is dictated by uh, what you have set as your placeholder cameras so uh, perhaps I should just show you this and it will make a lot more sense if I come into my uh, preferences for Ecamm which have uh, disappeared again uh, here they are uh, and we go into the recording section, uh, this is where we can set this up. So first of all, uh, record all broadcasts is an option that you can check so that it records even when you're streaming. Obviously, we have got control over that in any case from the little drop down to select whether we want to record or stream. So you can override that. Um, but here is where we can select isolated video tracks. And what you'll notice is um, it says, uh, in addition to normal recording, record selected video sources to a separate file. Um, and then you've got these check boxes. So you can check camera A and camera B. And those relate directly to uh, the camera A and camera B in the switcher. So uh, if you uh, look here in these placeholder cameras, camera A, camera B, you have got the option to add more. So we can have B, C, D, A, E, and so on. Uh, and we can just keep adding more of those in. Um, but specifically on your local machine, um, it is gonna record up to two cameras so or I say up to two <laughs> it's, it's only two um, and so that would be uh, obviously the main recording uh, a camera A and camera B so if in this case I've got you know four different cameras connected then at the moment uh, we can only record two of those so you have to make that decision as to which ones you wanted those to be uh, but just bear in mind then uh, that whichever ones you want to record they those do have to be in the placeholder slots for A and B uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, you've also then got the option to uh, record the interview guests and that is for all interview guests. So potentially here you could be encoding 13 separate recordings, uh, 10 guests, uh, two placeholder cameras um, and then your obviously your main recording. The thing to note about this is that um, whatever you've got your stream settings set at for Ecamm, so if I come into uh, recording, sorry, <laughs> uh, output, options I should say um, and I've got this set to high resolution 1080p um, if I'd got that at 4k the main recording would be at 4k but there is a limit on these placeholder cameras uh, at 1080 so you're only going to get 1080 out of camera A and camera B and currently uh, for the interview guests uh, the limit is 720 so that's what resolution you're going to get for those recordings so you can have uh, maybe 4K for your primary recording, uh, 1080 for those two placeholders, and then 720 for the interview guests. And that's just down to, uh, I guess, you know, wanting to make sure people don't suddenly start encoding, you know, 13 4K streams, uh, and then wonder why everything's grinding to a halt on their computer. So uh, there is that. Uh, you've also got the option then in here to apply camera effects to recorded video source. So you can see how we can go in and tweak our camera uh, settings. Uh, you may want to preserve those settings and uh, record that into the ISO or you can kind of bypass those so if you don't have that checked then it's basically going to just take the raw feed coming in uh, so that's just something to bear in mind uh, by the way if you are doing interviews uh, the camera effects window is a great way to actually help you know sharpen up your guests you may give them the best instructions to uh, you know come on being positioned in the right place on screen uh, you know having their other settings of their camera set up correctly, uh, but to know that you can actually go in and adjust their uh, settings for you know what is coming into your stream is really useful. And then again, if you're going to record isolated video, you may want to carry those settings across. So that's just something to be aware of. Uh, record isolated audio, um, that's now also in here as well. Uh, previously, it was in the audio section. 
so as I say, the record isolated audio, we've had that functionality for a while, uh, but it has just now moved in the preferences uh, from the audio section into the recording. Speaking of audio then, there's also the option here with camera A, B and the interview guests. Um, you can choose to either have the program audio, which means it's going to capture everything, or you can actually record the isolated audio for that particular uh, camera um, into that file. So the sort of use case that I mentioned earlier about wanting to maybe repurpose content from a, an interview show, uh, you might want to have just the, the guest and their own audio and nothing else on that particular file. Uh, so you can set that there as well. Um, and then in here, this is also where you can set the uh, recording format. So uh, that's moved from, uh, I think it was just in the, uh, I forget which section it was in, maybe the general before, but anyway, it's now all in this recording section. Uh, and this is also where you choose your recordings folder, where you want all of this stuff to be saved at, uh, saved to. And uh, so then what you're going to get is rather than a single file, if you've got any of these things selected, um, then you're going to get a folder instead of a file. And in that folder, you'll find uh, all of the different recordings, all the different files. If you've got isolated audio, you'll see the audio in there as well. Uh, potentially the SRT file for your um, chat if you've been live streaming as opposed to recording. And then also uh, your timestamps if you've been adding timestamps in using that new feature, they'll just all be in one single folder. Next up then is interview mode. And I've sort of been talking about this on and off with uh, various other different things. But uh, basically the main thing to know about this is that the um, the number of interviewees you can have on has been increased from four to 10. Bearing in mind, interview mode is a pro feature in any case, uh, but the increase from four to 10 is only for Apple Silicon. Again, just because of the, uh, you know, the processor required to handle that. Maybe that will change uh, in the future in terms of, you know, more, <laughs> more people being able to add it on top of that 10, who knows? Uh, although, God help you if you want to try and manage uh, 10 people at a given time on a particular live stream. However, there is a use case, though, for having uh, up to 10 people, and that is that they may not all be on screen at the same time, because one of the great uses for interview mode is if you are running virtual conferences or virtual events where you want to have your guest speakers coming in on interview mode, um, and then you know that's going out either to a live stream or maybe into a, a Zoom webinar or whatever it happens to be. And so because you can now have more people in there, uh, what you may have is you know maybe four or three or five or whatever it is in and on screen at any given time uh, but then just others kind of in the green room as it were waiting to come on and so that's a way that you can sort of manage that so there is a use case for having you know those 10 people in even if they're not all on screen at the same time and again that just comes back to why that camera switcher is useful if you are doing something like that where you can actually see all of those people quite clearly on on your screen as the producer uh, and then bring them in uh, as and when and just sort of visually see that they're actually there and uh, and ready to be coming on to camera. Next, let's take a look at overlays. And uh, there's a few changes that have happened here. So uh, first of all, let's look at widget overlays, because as I said at the beginning, these are something that was previously pro only, and now it's both pro and standard plan on Intel or Apple Silicon, it makes no difference. Um, but there's this great new functionality which has been added because previously uh, widget overlays, and by the way, widgets are uh, ways to use essentially HTML code or web code, JavaScript or whatever to display something on your screen. And so typically they can be used for for things like uh, I have a buy me a coffee link that can pop up. So if somebody buys me a coffee on a live stream, then it will pop up on the screen, uh, subscribe accounts and things like that. So they're these little things that can basically uh, send stuff onto your uh, screen, as it were, whilst you are live streaming or recording. Uh, you can program your own web widgets to do various different things as well. But the functionality that's been added now is the ability to actually interact with them. And what that means is it's really easy to use web widgets as a way to embed uh, things like websites or even videos onto your screen. So let me show you what I mean by this. So I'm just going to go to my overlays window and then I'll go down to where it says uh, this one. It doesn't say anything, but the widget overlay, I should say. Uh, click on that one, the little globe icon. And here you can give it a name. That's the name that it's going to appear as in your overlays window. Um, but then here you can drop in the URL. So I'm just going to drop in the URL of a YouTube video, my previous live stream. Uh, another thing that's changed with widget overlays is the uh, default uh, size and uh, frame rate. So it's now 720 and the frame rate is uh, th uh, 30 frames per second. I forget what it was before, but it's uh, increased slightly from before. Uh, and there's a couple of other options here, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, but for the time being, the widget URL, I'll leave that like that. Uh, click add widget, and then it's going to load it up 
Now, it's going to start this playing in a moment. It's not so, just uh, a deck of cards. This is a we collection got, some, uh, of playing. 54 <laughs> but beautifully this designed This down here is the key one. It's this one that's the picture of the little sort of finger. If I click on that, from I'm going to be able to interact in with the video. So now I could uh, interact with it. I could turn the audio off. Bear in mind, the audio is passing through from the widget as well. So it's just going to play these uh, play these ads skip ads that's going to go into the presentation uh, but that's the thing that's different here about these widget overlays is that uh, i can now interact with them uh, whereas before um, you couldn't actually do any interaction so if i toggle that one off i can move this where i want it i can also use option to crop in so if i did just want to uh, play a youtube video and uh, crop into it uh, then i can do that so that I don't have all of the rest of the stuff around it. Obviously, I'm just sharing my own YouTube video here. So you definitely want to uh, be conscious of if you are sharing something from YouTube, uh, what it is you're sharing. We're talking but about what we like about this Ecamm. is how I could sort of bring in something uh, as a widget rather than the way that I would have done this before would have been with a screen sharing. That overlay. is one of the things that sort of unites us all. And and the key thing to this is this interaction feature here. So it's just this little one here to be able to toggle that on and off. And if it's toggled on, it means you can interact with it. So you can use all the controls, start and stop and so on. Uh, and then you can also go back like that. It's also great for just general websites. So if I were to get uh, a different uh, widget in here, for example, if I just close this one down, I'll go and add a new widget overlay here. And let's just put in ecamm.com like that and we'll add that one as a widget overlay then you'll see now we've just got the ecamm website and once again um you can crop it you can resize it um we could uh, scroll around it oops a daisy not like that i hadn't uh, <laughs> hadn't interacted a bit a uh, bit too trigger happy there uh, if i toggle that one on though and then we were to go and say click in one of these other things uh, maybe click in here um to go to the next page um, then from here, uh, you've got these back and forth arrows to go backwards. So those are just sort of back and forward in terms of uh, as you would get on a browser. Uh, and then you've also got the uh, this one here to reload if you want to reload the page as well. Um, now, I mentioned about the uh, those other little fun uh, bits of functionality in the widget. So if I bring up my YouTube one again, uh, and I'll show that one, and I'll bring up the settings, you'll notice here it's starting from the beginning again. Um, so it started oh, right from the beginning the rather than where Today we left we off. So if you do want something to start from where you left off, maybe a video or something like that, uh, then if you come in and adjust these settings, the one that you would want is this one, which says uh, keep running. So you can see you've got the option there to keep running. Uh, you've got a couple of other things here which aren't necessarily going to be applicable to this kind of thing uh, but fill entire frame the widget will fill the broadcast and can't be moved or resized uh, so that's going to take over the whole of your screen rather than just floating um, so you may or may not want to do that uh, and the next one here is high resolution mode uh, may prevent smooth animations for larger widgets so maybe we'll just try that with this one and see the effect it has uh, it's presumably going to uh, reload uh, Nescafe later and now it's going to play as another ad. <laughs> um, but this is, uh, this is basically going to have a slightly higher resolution. Mm. Uh, if I, there we go. Uh, an advert for coffee in Thai. <laughs> uh, so that is widget overlays. And I think that that is a really interesting uh, use for um, widgets is to actually, you know, if you want to play videos and things like that uh, online or maybe show websites, then this is another way of doing it rather than uh, doing it with screen sharing and this can be useful as well if you're uh, maybe short of screen real estate and don't have space for ecamm and a browser open uh, to, to be able to do the sharing uh, then this is another interesting and useful solution for that also on the subject of overlays there's been some additions to the countdown overlays or the timer overlays so you get to those with the uh, overlays window and then down at the bottom here this one to add uh, add a timer overlay and what's changed here is just a couple of minor things really um, first of all is the uh, countdown to an amount of time uh, is there uh, they've added countdown to a date and time but they've actually added a calendar picker so we had that before but it was just you had to type it in manually so now there is a calendar picker in there the other one that they've added in though is this one here uh, countdown to a specific time uh, every day so it's 
you know, basically you could just set that to a default time. You don't have to go and set a specific date, uh, but also it doesn't have to be a specific uh, amount of time. Uh, you know, if you know that you go live at whatever time it is, uh, 10 o'clock every day, uh, you could just uh, set that to 10 o'clock and then it would always count down to that same time every time you, uh, you start that scene up. Uh, the other thing that they've added in here though as well is also in the stopwatch um, you can now disable the milliseconds so uh, you don't necessarily have to have that on if you don't need to be that pre precise about whatever it is you're using your stopwatch for. So that is uh, the few minor changes with the uh, the timer overlays. Uh, another couple of things is related to um, camera overlays. Uh, I've already talked about that idea of where you have a camera that's no longer on, um, then you get that sort of little bounding box around it. Uh, well, they've also changed the way that guests come in. Um, so previously, when you had uh, interview mode on, if I just show you what a guest used to look like, you I'm sure you're familiar if you've been using Ecamm on interview mode, uh, this silhouette of a person, that's what you would see as the kind of the placeholder for somebody, um, one of the interview guests, you know, interview guest one, two, three or four, as we had before. Um, whereas now those are just shown like this with a white bounding box around them. Uh, and it just says guest one. And those don't actually show up on the stream as well. So if you've got, you know, a placeholder for a guest and then they drop out, um, rather than getting that silhouette, they're just going to completely disappear. Next up is things related to Stream Deck and Loop Deck. There's been a number of sort of iterations in terms of just updating general updates with uh, in line with the updates to the Loop Deck and Stream Deck itself. Uh, we've also got a new model of Loop Deck out as well, the uh, Loop Deck uh, Plus. So uh, that one has got some dials on it. So there's some functionality added there. Um, and there's a couple of other really, really uh, useful uh, features added in. So let's just take a look, shall we, at what these new functions are. So in the Ecamm Live um, Actions, uh, I say this every time, but this has got to be like one of the most complete set of actions of any developer that's uh, sort of making their, uh, you know, integrating with Stream Deck. Um, it's just uh, phenomenal to see all of these different things. You can control so much of Ecamm with Stream Deck. Um, it can just become like totally mission control. Anyway, I've, uh, I've said that so many times before, but worth uh, just repeating it again. It's great to see all of this uh, control that we've got over Ecamm within uh, Stream Deck. So what's been added here is uh, we've talked about that uh, ability to add chapter markers uh, previously that's now been added in 4.0 into the uh, the menu items along the top and a keyboard shortcut. Well, now we've got that here as well. So you've got this add marker. Uh, this is a new action that you can add in. And the way that this works is um, you can basically just hit the button and it will add the uh, marker just like before, adding a specific timestamp uh, for that, you know, every time you hit it. Um, but you can also add in marker text here as well. So if you wanted to uh, actually create a series of markers for a series of chapters throughout your video in advance, um, then you could just literally be going through and hitting these markers as you reach that point in your live stream. And then it's going to create this whole uh, uh, text file for you. So there, or you'd have to say, is chapter one, uh, add another one for chapter two, chapter three, and so on, or whatever the, the actual names of them are. Um, and then as you're going through your live stream, just be hitting these buttons and it would then mark them uh, off for you in your in your text file. Uh, you've also got the option to pop up that dialogue box. So if you remember when you hit the keyboard shortcut in Ecamm, it's going to actually pop up a dialogue to give, you know, allow you to type in the, uh, the, the, the chapter marker or whatever. So you can also do it that way as well. So if you want to just have a button to press uh, and then it's going to come up. Obviously, if you're on a live stream, you're unlikely to want to uh, say to everyone, hang on a minute, I'm just going to make a note of uh, something and type down the uh, the, the title of it. Uh, however, uh, for remote production, this is great. If you're remote produ uh, producing for someone else, uh, then sure, you've got time to uh, hit the button and then be typing away in there. So really useful to have that as a feature. Uh, and so that is that add marker uh, button just there. Uh, the other one then that we've got is if I just take out this add marker, uh, the other one that we've got is um, related to chat. So we've had this add last comment to the screen if you are, you know, live streaming um, and also hide comment. Well, now we've got this one, which is called post comment. Uh, and what that means is you can type comments in advance, just as we've done with chapter markers. You could type some specific comments in here uh, and that might be, uh, I don't know, links to your uh, your website links to some offer you're running, uh, stock answers that you want to be able to post during a live stream. And you can write these text messages out in here. Uh, so like check out my Ecamm Live Masterclass. 
like that. And then during the live stream, I can just hit this button uh, and it will post that into the chat. So that's a really, uh, really handy feature for all those links and things like that that you want to talk about as you are going through your live stream. Another great way, though, to use these things together is imagine if you've got a series of scenes set up in Ecamm Live. Uh, maybe you've got a scene, you know, with a title or something like that, a bit like I've been doing today, uh, you know, having different titles all the way through. Um, then what you can do for that is uh, rather than have just a comment separately, uh, you could maybe right click in here, create multi action. And then imagine if you went in here and selected run a particular scene in Ecamm. So it's going to change to a particular scene. Um, then you're also then going to drop in a, a chat message, uh, that chat message that I've just put, say, you know, check out my course or whatever it happens to be. Uh, I've just typed some random letters in here. Um, and then you could also have in your timestamp down here as well. So that way you could literally have your run of show programmed out in here. Uh, and then as you're pressing the buttons, it's uh, first of all, it's posting the relevant link into the chat. It's switching the to the relevant scene in Ecamm. Uh, and then it's also then um, putting in that chapter marker for you. So using multi actions with these things is where this really comes into its own. So uh, really great to see these uh, additions coming into uh, into into the stream deck. Uh, there's just so many, <laughs> so many of these uh, actions in here. If you are using Ecamm, and you haven't yet got a stream deck, uh, check out the link in the description. You've got to get one. It's, uh, it's <laughs> It transforms Ecamm, I think, having a stream deck. The other um, functionality that's been added related to Stream Deck is related to the uh, the Stream Deck Plus with dials, because uh, if I switch over to my Stream Deck Plus from in here, um, the way the, uh, the dials work is... Um, you can uh, basically adjust um, audio levels in Ecamm. So uh, not many people have got plugins for the uh, that work with the dials in Stream Deck, uh, but of course Ecamm do. So here are the ones that I'm using so far. Um, I'm not using Philips Hue, but it's the only one that's got one in there at the moment. Um, and then you've got Stream Deck System Wavelink from Elgato. Uh, and yeah, look, one lone uh, <laughs> company up here uh, actually made a decent plugin for the uh, Stream Deck Plus. And the way that this works is uh, you basically have got a series of uh, dials and you can just come into here and add on something. So let me just delete what's on here. In fact, let me go to another page like this. Here we go. Uh, and I'll um, add on the Ecamm Live input level to this dial and it will tell me um, that this is the primary mic, but I can select anything from here. So I could have it adjust, uh, not just the primary mic. Whoops, a daisy, double clicked off that for some reason. I can choose the secondary mic, movie, system audio, uh, Skype, interview, sound effects, and so on. Um, so this dial then is going to be adjusting that audio. So at the moment, it's set to primary mic. Uh, so if I uh, just dial that down, uh, what you should see is that I should be getting quieter uh, as I dial it down, and then I'll be getting louder again as I dial it back up. What you can also do with the Stream Deck Plus, though, is you can make what are called stacks. So if I were to just delete something from here, get rid of all of these. Um, so here you can uh, create a dial stack. Um, and there it's a bit like multi actions in Stream Deck, um, but you can basically uh, where you sort of have this separate window and you just add different things in. So here what I could do is I could add a series of input levels for Ecamm, for example, like this. And then that could be my primary input. Uh, this one could be a second mic. This one could be uh, movie levels. Whoops, wrong one. I like that. And then the way that that works on the dial is that you see there is a mic level, but then if I press the button as well, so the dial uh, rotates, but then I can press it. And as I press it, it's going to change to mic two level, and then I can make adjustments to that. Press it again, uh, movie level, and make adjustments to that. And that essentially is exactly what I've done over here. So I've got my uh, movie level, and then system level, effects level, and so on. So that's on that single dial, but I can adjust multiple things. And then I've also got all of my interview guests over on this one. So as I tap through that, it's interview guest one, guest two, guest three, and so on. So I've just got those two dials, one for interview guests and one for my uh, other, all the other audio in Ecamm. 
So it's great to be able to have those on the dials. I was previously using uh, Loop Deck to control the audio in Ecamm. Anyone who uh, watches my channel will know I'm not a huge fan of Loop Deck. <laughs> I find the user interface is not so uh, not so great. So I'm, it's great to be able to have that all in the uh, one Stream Deck ecosystem because I find that it does it is a lot more uh, flawless in terms of the implementation of everything. There's a final few uh, general compatibility updates as well. So uh, first of all, is they've updated the uh, compatibility with uh, NDI just to bring it up to date with the latest uh, NDI spec, which is 5.5.1. Uh, but also they've added in support for deck link. And this is uh, from Blackmagic. Uh, this is a way another sort of uh, video transfer protocol, I guess, is the way to describe that. Uh, and this you can find in the uh, output here. Uh, so in the same way that before we've got NDI output and NDI being a way to transmit video over a network. Uh, well, you've also got this way to interface with any Decklink uh, devices that you've got. So uh, you can see Blackmagic desktop not installed, so I don't have it on my computer. Uh, but here is where you would uh, you would do that if you did. And then there's a little what's this to find out more all about that. On top of that, just a whole load of other tweaks, refinements and improvements uh, and general uh, sort of usability improvements. Uh, so that really covers the bulk of the new features. I'm sure there's going to be one or two that I might have missed in there. If I have, do leave a note and let me know in the comments. If you've got any questions, obviously feel free to uh, shout out and leave those in the comments too. And uh, I will be doing a live stream, as I mentioned, on the, this in a couple of days time. Uh, and I'll leave a link to that in the description too. Uh, that will be going into a little bit more detail into some of those features not so much the headline ones but some of those other uh, features that i have really finding that i'm enjoying most and the way that i am using those so that'll be all covered on my live stream but what i'll do is i'll also leave a link over on the uh, right hand side there for you to check out some other ecamp videos i've just got to say a big thank you also to my channel members i really appreciate your support and helping me keep on the studio lights have a great day everyone and enjoy ecamp version 4